Hello, everybody, and welcome to the August 1st Trips and Traps. Andy Serpin, joined by Eric Donovan. Saratoga in full swing here, and as a result, we have plenty of races to choose from here at the spa, but we have to narrow it down to six, and we'll get things started off with the race number six, a strong allowance race from uh, J- uh, July 24th, a one-mile uh, event for a four-year-old's number. We're looking at the outside horse here, Mr. Commons, a former grade one winner. A lot of uh, horses in this race, grade one caliber horses, in fact. Yeah, a lot of certainly great stakes caliber horses. Mr. Commons at one time was considered one of the top milers in the country. Things haven't worked out that well for him, and his form seems to have tailed off. But I think his performance in this race was a lot better than it looks, and it has the feel to me of a prep for him for maybe the Baruch later in the meet. It was a race that on paper didn't appear to have a lot of pace, and there wasn't a ton of pace in the race, except the race totally collapsed. First of all, the rider doesn't do anything to get the horse inside to save ground, to use his natural speed, so he ends up getting swung out wide, and he loses position in the first turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just no no seemingly plan coming out of the gate there where, okay, I want to take back, I want to move to the inside as soon as possible, or I want to leave for position and you know try to get the best position possible. That doesn't happen, and that's why Mr. Commons from that outside post ends up you know three or four wide around the track. That's one of the reasons Jerry Bailey was so great in the turf, especially up here, as he always had a plan in these two-turn mm-hmm. races and understood what he had to do to maximize his chance of getting good position. So Mr. Commons basically spends the race in no man's land. As you see him out there, he's going to make a sort of premature move. He makes a move of the lead, and he ends up fading and not theoretically running that well. In a blanket finish, he finishes fifth in here. But I'm going to take the viewpoint that maybe going in, they thought, you know, we got the outside post. He missed the poker. He needs a race. Let's just give him a little trip around the racetrack. I mean, obviously, you want to win, but in theory, you know, we know we have a horse that might be a little bit short, and this race could set him up very well going forward. It could set him up well going forward. Uh, I agree with you there, and we'll take a look at him uh, on the outside there and about the uh, three or four path turning for home. On the other hand, though, Andy, you know, he's kind of a, a made horse already, though. You know, I mean, he's got a little bit of a reputation depending on what he's up against here. You, you know, I got to imagine he's probably going to be one of the favorites in, in his next race. I don't know. Huh? I don't know about that, Eric. I think off of this race and his recent efforts, I don't know. It depends. Listen, you, know, you don't really know. You're the morning line maker, but until you've seen the field in front of you, you can't have an idea really what price he's going to be. And he's certainly going to face Silver Max and Bernard Baruch if he runs there, and Silver Max coming off a nice win with a 102 buyer at Monmouth Park. I don't know. We'll see what kind of price he is, but what I'm saying about Mr. Commons, I think the first glance, a lot of people might say, "Eh, he really just didn't run well at all. He's supposed to beat Mm -hmm. those horses. Well, Seal Cole was not a bad horse, and Turler actually seems to have rebounded his form. Another horse who was reborn in Saratoga, a place he was terrific two years ago. He's going to be back in all likelihood in the Bernard Baruch, a race that he won already, and coming off of this race, isn't he going to be a shorter price than Mr. Commons? Um, It's going to be close. It's going to be pretty close. I think between them, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the success he's had at Saratoga, maybe he'd be a, maybe he'd be a slightly shorter price. Yeah, I guess you got to see what the prices are and how the race sets up. But I think you're right about you know in terms of this race, you know, not being the most important race he's going to run all year. Yeah, that's that's that was my basically my feeling in, in thinking about the race. I think he ran enough to get something out of the race. All right, well, let's take a look at some two-year-olds now in the dirt debate in special weight race number two from July 25th. The horse that breaks a, about a half a step slowly, the five a crescent, a first-time starter for a Bill Mod Bruce Lunsford, the six pure sensation. We'll also take a look at his well, a first from Christophe Clement, who has some speed here. Well, anybody that's dying to bet Crescent back out of this race, I mean, I will say that for a Bill Mott firster to run third, these two-year-olds, it's often a good sign, as he doesn't really have him cranked up win first time, but I don't think anybody who rationally looks at this race is going to say anything other than the fact that Crescent was taking advantage of a monstrous speed duel. Yeah, I think it gets lost sometimes, you know, in, uh, when, when, you, when people handicap two-year-old races that, uh, you know, well, it was his first start, he was way back early on, he broke a little bit slow, he made a big move late. Belmont doesn't have him cranked up to be you know, ready first time out most of the times, which is true. But on the other hand, his late finish here, I think, is going to be you know, so magnified by this three-way pace battle up front that you know, I'm taking him with a grain of salt next time out. If he's a short price, I don't want him. I, I can't imagine a scenario where I'm dying to bet Crescent. I mean, anything is possible. And I imagine anybody that looks in the pace base figures would be looking to bet pure sensation over Crescent. I know there's some sort of argument. We were talking about this a little on uh, the National Racing Report with Richie, and Richie's saying, you know, a hard race first time out can knock a two-year-old out. Sometimes it can, but sometimes I think too much is made of that, and maybe it just helps make him tougher going down the road. This is true, and with a guy like Christophe Clement, he's not going to run this horse back in a, you know, a week or ten days just to you know get him another race at Saratoga. They're going to be taking their 
their time with the source if, this, if the race really truly you know took something out, uh, out of them. Yeah, and listen, maybe Crescent really will be okay, but Crescent has much more of a sprint pedigree anyway, so I doubt that these horses are going to be stretching out to a mile right away at Belmont Park. And anyway, a horse who took advantage of a speed duel to close at five furlongs, stretching out to even seven furlongs, I don't think that's a particularly uh, exciting betting proposition. And I agree with you that Crescent's a horse. Maybe the public will go for him off those things. I hope they do. I won't be betting him. Now, the winner, Corfu, was part of that speed duel, a heavy favorite here, first time out for uh, Todd Pletcher. Um, a horse that, uh, you know, I thought was okay here. I-, I wasn't overly thrilled with, though. No, because the final time didn't come up that fast, and it came uh, back like almost a few seconds, few fifths of a second slower than the pr- impressive Philly first time star for Todd Pletcher later in the day. And these are Colts. And considering how much money they spent for this, I think it was a high 600s, mm-hmm. how much hype you heard, it was a disappointing effort. But those were, I mean, on a pace based look, this was a fast race because those two horses were really, three horses actually, were really going at it. All right, we'll uh, take a look at three-year-olds now in the Curlin Stakes going a mile and eight. This uh, likely a prep for the Travers, or you know, a couple horses might go on. Probably the uh, top two, at least that uh, crossed under the wire, the uh, top two here. We're going to take a look at Romance first here. The 1A stumbles badly coming out of the gate. I tell you something, I was really impressed. I mean, look at that bad stumble by, by Romance there, and dropping back. And he doesn't lose a huge amount, about a couple lengths, but those stumbles can jar a horse. And he's coming off of a perfect trip maiden win that I think got an 81 buyer. And, Man, did, did I mean, Transparent won the race, and it's impressive. It was coming off almost a four-month layoff. But Transparent worked out a terrific trip in this race, whereas Romance, I thought this was a sensational performance by him. It was. Well, uh, Transparent saves the ground going into the first turn. Romance ends up in about the uh, three or four path uh, going into the first turn there, and the uh, five-horse proud strike also uh, up with that uh, pack as well. All three of them are kind of right near each other right now. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, because of the incident that happened around the turn and resulted in Transparent being justifiably disqualified, we don't know what Proud Strike would have done in here. Now, I picked Proud Strike in here. I'd like to take the optimistic viewpoint that my opinion wasn't horrendous. You never really know. But considering how the race shaped up, you would think he would have made a run. But considering it got a 99 or 99 or 100 buyer for the winner, I'm not sure that you can say the Proud Strike rated to be transparent, but it might have been interesting. It might have been, and Proud Strike could have easily have just been completely pulled up after the incident. Instead, you know, he kind of gets back on track a little bit and actually beats two in here, and you still see him. They're kind of, you know, right next to each other once again, but you see how Romance just really never gets a spot where he can kind of tuck away down inside and save some ground throughout the running of the race. He's just kind of hung out there wide the entire trip, and now uh, with a couple of horses coming up the inside, he's in about the uh, the forepath out there, and that's where he's going to be going around the turn, making a little bit of a middle move. You almost wonder if with Romance, if, if the rider had settled him in back after the incident of the start just taking a shot and says, I'm going to try to make one late run here, and there he is on the outside, where he would have finished. You know, lost in this a little bit are the two horses up front, because one of them is Ciro, who I'm not a big fan of. Well, he finished last behind Keg Party, which is almost embarrassing. Um, but the other one is Proud Ombre that's doing all the dirty work, dueling inside. He only gets beaten less than five lengths in here, and you consider how far he finished in front of Ciro. It wasn't that bad a performance, Eric. No, it wasn't, but I think, you know, the others are, I think, are a step above him here. I mean, Romance, and you see the stuff. Well, Romance there. is clearly better than Yeah, him. I mean, you see the stumble there with Proud Strike uh, when the uh, one transparent that came out looking for some room. And, you know, I can't really fault the uh, Rod Ortiz too much there. I, I, you know, I think he looked over and didn't see a horse there and came out. And it's hard to see back there, I think, where he is. Richie made a point yesterday in the National Race for it. There was a valid one that maybe he panicked a little bit and had to get yeah. there too quickly. And, and, I, and also the rider of Proud Strike isn't used to riding around here, so he isn't aware of how much hurting goes on here and how the hurting is condoned by our stewards. So, in fact, riders get away with it and they do it. And he wasn't really ready for it, and that may have contributed to the incident. I'm going to tell you, I, I, I'm disagreeing with you about Proud Ombre. The more I watch this race, the better I thought he ran in there. I, I think his performance rivaled, w- w- I wouldn't say it rivaled Transparence, but it was a lot closer than the four lengths suggest. Okay. I just thought he ran really well in there. Okay. Uh, I mean, these horses just moving forward with every start. Okay. So, this is a good field. It was a good field, yeah. yeah. It, it was a real good field. It'll be interesting to see how, how many of them go on to the Travers and uh, you know and what they do in there. And it'll be interesting to see where these three-year-olds go as the season goes on. And, and I'll tell you, like, I'm a fan of this three-year-old crop. I know mm-hmm. some of the ones going longer haven't been running since sensational figures, though they're getting faster, and they're so lightly raced, Eric, as horses haven't been being whisked off the stud very quickly, we're starting to see horses develop at four and five yep. that we didn't think were such good horses, and given time, they've turned into good sure. horses, and considering how good the like three-year-old Macho Macho Man are, a couple years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Did you think the Mucho Macho Man? I mean, last year, there's a, there's an argument that Mucho Man, Macho Man was bad luck away from being horse of the year yeah. last year, and there's some, and he's still running, and he has a real chance to Whitney this weekend. I, I like this three-year-old group in all divisions, the Phillies on Colts, sprinting, long, turf, they're all good. All right. All right, we'll take a look at uh, 
Some uh, three-year-olds now in the uh, Sir Cat uh, going a mile on the uh, inner turf course here. And uh, this one, uh, we're going to take a look at Hamp, uh, a uh, number five horse in here. This is July 28th, race number one. This horse coming up for uh, Nacho Correas. I, I, I felt bad for Nacho. I'm friendly with Nacho. And he came all the way up with this horse, Hamp, a horse who improved dramatically in his first time going long on the turf. He shipped him up from Maryland. He faced much tougher horses. And because of bad luck, he lost a race that he very easily could have won. Now, you see him steadying in behind horses there. But I, I, that Jose was doing a good job with him. What he was really doing was taking him back to get position and save ground the first turn. All good for me. I don't mind. He stayed a little bit. Who cares? The problem was, I think that Rosario, who rode the winner-winning cause very subtly, did a masterful job of suckering Jose into that hole on the inside, knowing things frequently get tight in these mild turf races, and eventually, Hamp is going to completely steady out of the race. Yeah, he will try to come up in there and uh, not have enough room. You think uh, you, you think he's looking, Rosario's well, looking to get guys in there? And well, look where him? he is now, Hamp. He's two lengths behind winning cause, okay? He comes up in there. He's behind a tree there. <laughs> nice job, boys. Um, and he comes the, right he inside the there. He gets inside and just having a little fun here. And that's tough. There are a lot of bushes. Now he's made up like three to four lengths yep. on that horse that's in front of winning cause. And Joel's just sort of hanging out there. That horse, you'll notice, is off the hedge, too. Is he trying? He's trying to stay off the rail because he knows in these mile turf races you can get yourself in trouble right. committing the rail, especially if there's somebody outside of you. So by staying in the two path, he gives himself options. And now the horse completely steady back, and he's back to being behind winning cause. So he's basically wasted a three to four length move in here. He stays in the rail, and he gets in more trouble in the stretch. And by the time he can extract himself, Eric, winning cause is in a full rally. He's ahead of him. He's going faster, and poor Hamp has no shot. No shot here. Yeah, I agree. This was uh, this was you know a, a ride that uh, could have been done a little bit better had he stayed a little bit off the rail. I think you know guys like to get the rail. I guess it's got to be it's so tough, tough when it's you tough. see that huge opening at the yeah. rail, and you say, wow, I could save all all this ground here and, and get up in there and then all of a sudden the field bunches up, the horse comes over a little bit and you got to steady and then there goes that plan. And the other problem is, Eric, the alternative is to go around. Right. So now they says, well, I can go up on the inside or I can go in the three and four path. When I go in the three and four path, I'm going to yell at, I'm going to look stupid, I'm going to lose a race. So it is, it's very easy to watch the race afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think Jose Rascal was ran great up here. He yes. just got into a tough position with here. Maybe the ultimate answer here was just to be a little more patient. You know, maybe he's just supposed to sit sort of behind him mm -hmm. and watch what winning cause does but you don't know that winning causes do you know he's the worst to beat I, I don't know it's a tough it's easy to be a monday morning quarterback in situations but i do know that Hamp had a tough trip in here and might have been the best horse. Yeah, this was a tough race because to me there was really no clear horse to beat in there. I mean, you, you probably think, thought Joha was going to go to the lead, but other than that, I mean, he wasn't necessarily even the horse to beat once he got to the lead. So, you know, it's kind of a tough race to say, well, I'm going to, you know, try to ride around this horse and see what they do. And play it loud was the horse that I thought or the public thought was the horse to beat at 9 to 5. He, he beat one horse. He was dreadful in there. He ran so well in the Hill Sprints and horrible. He's starting in every other pattern so far. Two year old Phillies in action for our fifth race here on Trips and traps a maiden special way to mile and 16th on the Mellon Turf Course, race number two from the 28th. I just wanted to show a couple horses that had a little trouble. First of all, the seven Spangled Banner will stumble pretty badly, or nice and stumble, jumps up in the air and cost himself two, three lengths of the start and, and got a very good ride by Junior Alvarado thereafter, but uh, that really cost him and he might have been best. Ilapa, another horse that Jose Lascano was on, this is actually the race after Hamp. He was unlucky again. I'm sorry. I thought Jose rode the source fine, and he just got very unlucky. He did. I agree with you. Got uh, unlucky once again. There's Alapa down toward the uh, inside in the uh, Richard Pell uh, white and maroon silks, and then toward the back of Spangle Banner as well. We'll uh, roll it as they go into the first turn, and you see, uh, you know, Alapa getting some pretty good position here, a position you'd like to get, you know, going into that first turn. Yeah, and, and it's not as though he stayed right inside in the second turn. He was off the rail. He'd better off he stayed inside. He wouldn't have got to get stuck behind the horse who's leading now, horse I like, as he backs up to last. Something happened to that that horse in their macaroon. Alapa was a Nick Zito first-time starter that was six and a half to one in a turf race. That's a that's a horse that's supposed to be able to run because Nick's horses could be thirty to one in these races. Oh yeah, no, when when he gets action with the uh, two-year-old in the turf, you better think that they're going to be able to run. And it's just unfortunate here what happens because uh, Macaroon, who's out setting the pace right now, is going to you know basically back his way through the field, and 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 poor Lapa's just going to get caught up uh, behind Macaroon and uh, really you know give him no chance to, to to do anything here. No, that was that was just incredible bad luck. And by the way. The winner, Miss Frost, ran terrific in this race. She's the one chasing. Now, I'm not 
saying Macaroon collapsed because the pace was super fast. Obviously, it's like that with Macaroon. But still, they put some real distance between the field. And Miss Ross was very game in this race. I, I believe that Spangled Banner would have won if she hadn't blown the brake. But I'm not sure that ultimately Miss Ross wouldn't have been the best horse in the race. The horse I do not want going forward is the second finisher, Granny McKinnon's kitten. And there, by the way, is the seventh Spangled Banner in back. Yeah, we'll take a look at it here as uh, you still see the one Macaroon on the lead. But uh, Macaroon's going to start to uh, back up shortly there and uh, kind of back up in the face of Alapa as you see the uh, seven horse and that's uh, Spangled Banner toward the back of the pack just trying to start to get uh, you know get a little bit of a move but down inside and kind of has to wait a little bit. Here it comes right now okay you can see Macaroon is stopping and right behind him there's Macaroon stopping backing up and right behind is Alapa it's almost like one of those things when you're walking towards a door and somebody takes a right you go left they go they go to their right <laughs> whatever happened Alapa just gets taken completely out of the race and there Alapa now Jose gets around he tries to get around he gets taken out further there's the seven Spang uh, Spangled Banner cutting the corner. There's poor Alapa on the outside, and Alapa doesn't finish well. Clearly, Spangled Banner finishes better, but Spangled Banner has been sitting in the back of the back, sitting on the rail, not doing any real running, whereas Alapa's already had a monster headache. This is a first-time starter. has already had this sort of annoying experience, and it's not surprising Alapa doesn't finish. Alapa is going to run finish a lot better in a subsequent start. Spangled Banner might be a horse that gets very dressed up, that ran well in here, but I kind of want a lot more. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I think Spangled Banner had the clearer shot through the stretch to, to, to make a big run and to have an impact on the race. I know Spangled Banner, uh, you know, didn't get off to the greatest of starts there, but I still think you know, top of the stretch home, he had a much better chance to do some, or she had a much better chance to do some solid running than Alapa did. Yeah, and Alapa just got in, in, in such trouble that you just have no idea whether or not she can run. If you are on, have some faith that the money was right in here and she can run, you should have no problem taking a shot at her next time, and she'll be a good price. She will indeed. We'll take a look at one more race. This is the sixth race from July 29th, New York Red Nominers, one allowance, five and a half on the Mellon Turf course, the seven Iron Power, our horse of interest here. Now, what you can't see at the start, you see the seven breaking slowly and being a length nap too, is I think the two or three horse. The three horse comes out, follows the four, five, and six, see the six eventually steady out, and because the seven broke slowly and the three pushed the four horses out, the seven, the door completely shuts in the seven. So not only does it get left, it gets shut. So now Joel is towards the back of the pack, and this was a Mike Hort Hushin horse, off a layoff with, with significant turf free on the damn side. And I, I think she just takes off on Joel Rosario because very shortly after this point, she is going to make a run from there to the front in about two and a half furlongs, four wide. That I got to tell you, it's impressive. Very quick turn of foot, and, uh, you know, Joel probably, you know, asked her for a little bit of run to get in position, and you're right. I think she just uh, kind of took off. Uh, he just took off with them there and uh, made this big run around the uh, far turn, and, you know, a run that usually leads to a horse flattening out, and that's exactly what Iron Power does. Yeah, here. right, exactly. I, I mean, I had bet Iron Power here. I saw this run, and I said, I'm not harboring any great illusions that Iron Power is just going to run off four legs in front of the field unless he's uh, going to win the Breeders' Cup sprint, <laughs> the turf sprint later in the year. But believe me, the next time Iron Power runs, I'm sure Joel would like to be on this horse again a clean break and a, a normal trip I, I will take my chances that uh, th this horse is able to beat an aptly named Bizarro World. <laughs> yes, I would say so. And you know what? I mean, we, we think back to uh, you know a horse uh, last year, Next Question, who had some trouble in some New York Red Races, was able to go up to Canada and, and win an open stake. I'm not saying that you know this horse is quite at that level oh. yet, but you never know. Turf sprints, I mean, you get a little bit of trouble, it could be all over quickly. Yeah, this horse could run. Well, uh, he's going to win a condition like this. Dr. Fergawi did have trouble at the start in that race. Mm -hmm. He deserves another chance. I think they just wanted to get a race into him. Dr. Fergawi is going to be in the dirt next time, and he's going to probably win. We need help up here. We can use your suggestions. We want to hear your suggestions. Trips and traps at iRing.com. Thanks for watching.